Bogratov, Shmi Daniel Globersom. I thought I'd get that out of the way. It's the extent of, uh, of the Hebrew that I remember from being fed as a child. Um, a huge thank you to the Bank of Israel, uh, to the governor, Amir Yaron, to the supervisor, Head Weber, as well as to a close friend of mine, somebody who uh, was kind enough to arrange everything, uh, Marav Shemesh. Many, many thanks. And I should probably also say thank you to the translator. Whoever's doing translation is absolutely amazing. Um, the reason I've had the headphones on isn't because I'm a DJ in my spare time. It's, uh, it's actually because my Hebrew is very, very poor. And she has done an amazing job. I actually wish that I had been a bit more focused as a child learning Hebrew. And uh, it's not the first time. I, just briefly, I have to tell you the first time I realized I should have studied Hebrew. Um, it's when I was 12 years old, and my grandfather, Sasha, he's about this tall, Russian Jewish fellow, of course, he sat me down in Boston, Massachusetts, where I grew up, and he said, yep, it's time for your bar mitzvah, and unfortunately, you didn't really do a great job studying Hebrew. So instead of doing the whole big thing here and in the temple, I'm going to take the family to Israel, one, because I met your grandmother there in Tel Aviv when it was the Mandate of Palestine in the 30s, and two, because what would be better than having your bar mitzvah atop Masada? Sounds like a good thing. I was all excited about it. I'm going to become a man on top of Masada. And um, getting back to the first time I realized that I had spent more time learning Hebrew, uh, he did take me to Masada, and, um, and we walked up Masada for my bar mitzvah in the middle of August. <laughs> that, my friends, is the first time I realized I should study Hebrew. <laughs> but nonetheless, I've come here to talk a little bit about open banking. Um, I do come from what I think is the only live market, although you can tell I'm American. Um, I have lived internationally my, almost my entire professional life, in the United Kingdom, where I am now, in Switzerland, as well as in, obviously in the States. And we do represent in the United Kingdom really the first attempt at what we call open banking. Uh, myself, uh, I know it says NatWest, just to be honest with you, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland is a large group. NatWest is the name that about 85% of our customers know and trust. Uh, for those of you who don't know Royal Bank of Scotland, if I roll the clock back to about 2007, 2008, we had the biggest bank, uh, balance sheet of any bank in the entire world. That was about two and a half trillion pounds of a balance sheet. That's a big one. Post-crisis, we're about two-thirds less than that. But what that means is we have more of a focus now on the UK, uh, commercial banking, corporate banking, small, medium enterprise, and obviously personal banking and wealth, and a little bit less of a focus on having the biggest business in the whole entire world. So that's why it says um, NatWest. So one of the most powerful things I think we can do is to quote people that we all uh, hopefully know. And so I want to introduce you to, I'm not going to go over the contents because that'll that will explain itself, um, introduce you to somebody named Mark Carney. Mark Carney is the governor of the Bank of England. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. Um, Mark's actually from Canada, which is an interesting mix. Although coming from America, most of us believe that's a state somewhere near Alaska. It actually is a country, I can assure you, it's a beautiful one as well. But um, Mark came out with a, wrong, uh, a rather strong statement, and I, did, I actually highlighted some words here. Wave of innovation, democratizing financial services, more inclusion, better connected, people being increasingly empowered, people and businesses, unbundling banking services into its core functions. The speakers before me this morning all talked about this very same thing. How do we create competition? How do we unbundle? How do we change the, the public's view that there's my bank and that's what, that's what I'm stuck with? Um, new entrants, uh, new technologies, uh, economies, of, uh, economies of scale um, enabled through technology, right? Pre the internet evolution, you couldn't really scale a bank. A bank was bricks, it was mortar, it was cement, it was buildings. Uh, in the internet revolution, we can scale to anything. You think of Amazon in 1994 as a bookstore. Now Amazon delivers actually to my very own house the same day we order most, in most occasions. So that's economy of scale enabled through digital technology. And we can create a financial system for a new age. That's none less than Mark Carney uh, in 2017 with a strong pitch for uh, what we could do in the United Kingdom as well as what we could do in Europe. And 
If I check my news right this morning, the United Kingdom is still part of Europe, so we're still safe to say that. <laughs> so I'm going to talk. I'm going to bounce around a little bit just to uh, drive some understanding of what we've done and why. Um, you're going to see one of these. Everybody has to have a Venn chart. So if you have, if you have a PowerPoint presentation, I have my Venn diagram, so that's one check for me. But um, on the left, we're showing the CMA. The CMA is our Competition and Markets Authority. Uh, the Competition and Markets Authority, by its very name, is designed to ensure competition in all industries. It's not just banking. In fact, banking is just one little piece. Utilities, telecommunications, shipping, everything. The Competition and Markets Authority, about four or five years ago, um, performed, I guess, an investigation of the retail banking market and determined, unsurprisingly, that there were too few banks. Probably not surprising to anybody who studied economics and that in free economies, the opportunity of scale tends to mean um, mergers, acquisitions, and uh, taking advantage of that scale. So the CMA did a lot of things, to be honest with you. We're not going to go over all of them. Uh, There's a lot of things about fairness and charges and fees and all the rest. But one of the things the CMA did was demand open banking. And if you want to think about it in a bit of a vacuum, what they really did is insisted that nine of the largest UK banks, by current account market share, uh, effectively implemented the vast majority of PSD2 open banking about 18 months earlier. And so that's put the UK in a position of being not just an early adopter, but the earliest adopter. So nine UK banks, the largest, that includes Northern Ireland, it's part of the UK. Uh, current accounts, so under the CMA order, they were only looking at current accounts, so that's where they started. Uh, most payment types you can make from a current account. And one of the things they did, which I think is incredibly important, and that's a view, is they insisted on standards. So rather than uh, a world where we have open banking, where each bank could set up an interface, which we'll talk about in a minute, and new entrants, uh, startups, fintechs, and others would have to learn each bank's interface, which costs money and time. They insisted on a standard. Not only that, they asked us to fund the body that created the standard. So this is probably the first time ever that nine banks worked together who normally compete to create a standard around anything that wasn't in their best interest. So that's what we had done. Um, that kicked off in January 2018 amongst those nine banks. And again, that's over 90% of current accounts. That's almost all public banking, to be honest with you. Um, on the PSD2 side, PSD2, Payment Services Directive 2, which implies there was a Payment Services Directive 1, which there was, um, that talks a lot about competition in payments. So a slightly different angle than competition just in banking and current accounts. This is Europe-wide. Um, this covers, this is driven by the European Commission. All European countries that are part of that have to enforce the law. PSD2 for open banking comes in September of this year. That's all EU financial institutions, so not nine big British banks. We're talking about thousands. The last count, I think there are 8,000 what we might call credit institutions and payment institutions across Europe. So all of those are in scope. All payment accounts, so any account you can make a payment from, all payment types, even those that aren't used that often. Um, the one thing that was probably a little bit of a miss, in my opinion, and I, and I, I think it's important for all of you, is there wasn't a mandate for standards. So that naturally is happening to an extent. There's a few different standards across Europe. If you, if you, if you look at this at all, you've probably heard of the Berlin standard and the Steda standard and all the rest. So there are some standards evolving, but realistically, there's nothing that mandates that to happen. So those are the drivers of open banking from a regulatory perspective. So how does, it, how does the thing work? Because it, it does sound a little bit scary at first around, and we've heard it from customers, by the way. We've been live since last January. We've got 8.2 million customers so far that can utilize open banking services. And one of the frequent things it, when customers do ask is, please don't share my data. Why are you giving my data away? And so obviously we have a long way to go in describing how it works and marketing it properly. But in terms of how it does work, everything starts with a customer on the top left. And what happens here is we have regulated third parties on the top right. Those third parties in the UK and Europe are approved for either account 
services, data services, payment services, or both. Um, they're approved by their national authorities, so the same authorities that approve banks. And so a customer actually digitally consents to a third party. So for instance, if I'm on a website that says, hey, we're gonna help you find a better deal on a mortgage, for instance, I can consent to that third party to see my account history to prove what I can afford and all the rest. And I can share that with them securely. They obtain my consent. I'm then redirected to my bank where I tell my bank that it's okay to share. My bank doesn't have to know anything about the third party because we have digital certificates and so on and these open banking directories that make it safe. But customers don't consent to their bank. They consent to a third party. And then they just, they're redirected to their bank digitally solely to authenticate, and I'll go through that in a second, um, that it's okay to share data with that third party. So the responsibility of that data actually sits with the third party in this case. So that's kind of how it pieces together. There's lots of technical jargon behind it, to be honest with you. It's not all that important. I want to take a quick detour because we always talk about APIs. In fact, it happens all the time. APIs this, APIs that, open bankings are on APIs. And one of the things that we tend to do a rather poor job of is, is explaining what an API actually is. So I'm not going to assume that three or 400 people know what an API is. I'm sure many of you do, tech, particularly if you have a tech background. Um, I've got an example here. One thing to keep in mind, APIs aren't new. The concept was developed, I'm going to say, in the late 60s, early 70s. So it's not a new concept. How it's being used is very new. So I've come up with something that many of you might be familiar with, and that's a picture of a phone. It has a map on it, uh, supplied by Google. Connects with your friends to tell them how much exercise you've done, Facebook, and has a device to track all your steps. Uh, clearly, I don't use one of those devices, but uh, many of you do, and uh, that'll, track your, that'll track your steps every day. All of that's enabled through APIs, application programming interfaces. Those are effectively interfaces. They're defined ways that systems talk to each other. So they're well-defined and they're exposed, so it's easy to connect. There's no guesswork involved. They kind of do what they say, and they're, and they're defined in that way. So this, is, this creates ecosystems. So if we thought about Amazon, Amazon didn't grow to the size it is today without being an API-enabled tech company. That was something that Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, insisted upon in 2002. And we as banks in 2019 are debating whether it's a good thing or not. I think he's done a pretty good job of explaining why it was a great thing. So how does that work? And you're going to have a little trouble reading this, but again, I want to get into some, some, some corners of this, some, some, some details of it, because I think that what's important is I kind of explain and help you understand how it really works for people. So as a customer, there's two different ways this could work. One way is I'm on my phone or on my desktop or on my tablet, and I go to a third-party site, and it redirects me to my bank after I've consented to share data or to initiate a payment. And I've, I've consented to that, I'm redirected, and a few things can happen. The first thing is, I could be challenged from my bank with my online banking credentials. Fair enough, if done well, and it's not, it hasn't always been done well, the regulators have a magnifying glass on those banks that haven't done a good job, but if done well, it feels just like you're logging into online banking, passwords, passcodes, whatever. That's not a bad journey, but it doesn't solve for one thing. It doesn't solve for many of us, and I'm gonna use the example uh, from Mr. Sturm, the uh, zap, 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 it doesn't solve for modern expectations. We're, we're modern people now. Doesn't matter what generation we're from, we're used to pressing one button, everything's done. My card's held on file, I press it, it's done. I want to order something, I press it, it's done. I want to order my get taxi this morning, I press a button and it's done. It's considered a lot of friction for people who use mobile phones which is about 60% of UK online banking users or mobile users, it presents friction they're not used to. In fact, if you were to ask me what my online banking credentials are, I'd be honest with you, and I just don't know. I use a thumbprint, I don't know what they are. And to make big payments, thankfully my wife doesn't let me, so I don't have to remember my credentials anyhow, thankfully. Um, in this case, we've moved to leveraging the mobile app. So instead of being redirected from the third party, to a kind of special bank web page to enter in your details to say it's okay to share. 
In this case, all it does is pass me my mobile app that's on my phone, I put in my thumbprint, and I'm good to go. And that's a huge step forward, and that's being implemented right now. So UK Open Banking has been live for about a year. That's now being implemented by the banks. That will change how it works. That will change everything for those people who otherwise either don't know their information or don't feel comfortable about it. Going to your mobile app and being asked for your biometric or your face or whatever else, whatever your bank thinks is safe, that is the best experience you can have. So that, that's why I want to dive into that just a little bit. It shows the difference between redirection and passwords versus mobile. So something certainly for our Bank of Israel friends to think about. So what makes a successful ecosystem in open banking? And whether, whether we consider, to consider the UK experiment successful or not yet, and it's early, there's some things that help move, move it along. There's oil for the gears that make thing, makes things work. And we've learned this over the past, not just years since we've gone live. This was 18, 24 months in planning, setting standards, having long debates and legal debates and all the rest. So I'm gonna go through them and they're not in any particular order. And again, some of it's biased based on my experience. API standards, adopting a standard, I believe is critical. I don't think it's, I don't think it drives competition to have every bank having a different interface and every third party, every FinTech, every competitor having to learn how that works. There's enough standards out there. There's a UK open banking standard. There's a Berlin standard. There'll be more. And even though there are a lot of standards, um, a fintech could either learn how all those standards work or they could partner with one of the emerging companies of which is over a dozen whose sole purpose in life is to standardize across all of those so that can be managed but i think it starts with standards uh, regulated entity directories this is another big one in order for customers to trust how this works every time a call comes into our interface every call not once a day not just the first time every call we get over a million calls a day on our interfaces. Um, we go straight to an open banking directory. That directory is connected with the regulator. So we'll know if a third party is approved. We'll know if their approval has been revoked. We'll know their exact status every time. That provides a lot of trust in the ecosystem. Liability models, what happens when something breaks? So when it comes to data sharing, or what in the UK and Europe we call AISP activities. When it comes to data sharing, whoever you've consented to access your data, if that's misused or lost, that's between you and them, not you and your bank. As long as, as, long as your bank did the right things and you authenticated that, you're, you're looking at the third party. That liability is important to understand. And that third party from a European perspective is responsible for GDPR. That's our data protection regulation. That's the really nasty one that says, you know, if you misuse a customer's data, it's going to cost you a lot of money. So the third party is responsible when sharing data. However, when a payment goes wrong, although your bank may not be liable, in our, in our world, in Europe, your bank has to fix it. And then your bank has to go sort out what went wrong and who's to blame. So there's a little bit of a different model there, but if you think about it, it kind of makes sense how that should work. And to be honest with you, if it wasn't, I, mean, I don't personally think it's great that banks are, are responsible for people maybe doing foolish things in payment land, but realistically, if you're going to drive competition and make customers confident, money moving is the most critical thing in the world, and customers need to know who they go to, and that's their bank. Um, approval processes, that kind of does what it says on the title. Uh, re reasonably easy to understand approval processes for different activities for, for new entrants. And approval processes which are transparent, so again the public has confidence that the regulators treating these new entrants, maybe not the same as a bank, but similar to a bank. Frictionless customer journeys, we just talked about that before. In the UK, some of the banks probably didn't think all that far ahead and put a bit too much friction in the journeys which clearly wasn't going to last very long. So they've now invested two times to make those right. And we gave the example before of frictionless in the mobile land is using your mobile app and biometrics, not entering in a bunch of passwords. 
dispute management. If something goes wrong, a dispute management, that doesn't, that can be run by anybody. It could be run by, the, by a banking group. It could be run by fintechs. It could be run by an industry body. But again, having a place to go when things don't go right and assuming, assuming that open banking to you includes payments in Israel, faster payment rails. In the UK, we're actually quite, I like to think we're quite advanced. We, um, we have a few things in flight. We have contactless, you heard about earlier. Massive use of contactless. Uh, we have faster payments. Our faster payments on average land in less than six seconds, I believe, today. So if you make a faster payment to another UK account, it's guaranteed to happen in two hours. Leave that aside. On average, they happen in just a few seconds. So it, um, it works. So, one thing that you're probably asking is, how's it going so far? And so far, we're off to what I believe, and I always expected it would be a slow start. Keep in mind, there's a few things at play. One, if you roll the clock back five or seven years, the UK, I think, was one of the first countries to do current account switching, which meant if you wanted to switch to another bank, it could be done in less than 24 hours. It was guaranteed by both banks that all of your direct debits and everything else wouldn't go wrong, nothing bad would happen. And for all of that excitement, less than 2% of the public switches their account every year. And that might seem strange, so why would you switch your account? I gotta be honest, as an individual, I suppose I could switch my account, there's probably a better deal on it, I'm sure, but when I wake up and I put a list together of the top 1,000 things I wanna do today, switching my current account isn't at the top of that list. It's probably important to keep that in mind because it, Although we think that if we made it easy, it would happen, it really hasn't happened. So, slow start. We are off to a slow start, as expected. A few things. One, lack of public awareness. The public in the UK doesn't know what open banking is. No idea what it is. When we went live in January 2018, they ran some surveys. I don't know if they were right or not. I think they might have been slight, slightly optimistic. They said something like 7% of the public had even heard of open banking. And we're not sure if they heard of open banking like this or if they just heard that their bank was open. I have no idea. But um, there is a lack of public awareness and compelling propositions. You as a consumer, me as a consumer, as a customer, there has to be something so compelling, so beneficial to me that I want to share my data. This is my personal data. And as a consumer, I, I don't know how the technology works and everything else, but I'm thinking, do I want to share my data? There's been breaches, right? In the US, you've probably heard about the Equifax breach, 400 million credit, personal, personally identifiable information related to the credit agency were lost. Yahoo, billions of records lost. We go through the long list, and that's not to dissuade you, that's to encourage you to think about the public's feelings towards sharing data. It has to be very compelling, one. And two, if it involves money, it probably has to be somebody that they trust which also creates a question in all, should create a question in all of your minds, which is, are the winners in this space gonna be the banking startup, the, you know, the, the five university grads sleeping on a pizza box, maybe? Is it gonna be big tech? The, there's probably a question to be asked about advantages that big tech has, because big tech already has more data on you than banks do nowadays. And in many cases, but clearly not all, the public trusts some of them. I, I'll be the first one, I'll be honest, I already did this before. I kind of trust these people with my data. I may not trust the social network with my data, but I certainly trust these people. I trust the world's largest online commerce site with my data. And by the way, those, those two know more about me than my bank does. This is modern times, yeah? Early implementation issues. Any times that there's friction, it creates concerns, not just for the public, but also for, um, for third parties. No, no, no startup wants to go in, or even a big company wants to go in to open banking and put something out there that doesn't work. Because the first bad experience a customer has, they'll never come back again. So early implementation issues were certainly there, and we're overcoming those now. APIs that didn't work quite right, they weren't available, weren't understood, etc. But the future's bright. On the other side of that, we have opportunities and offers. Financial health personal financial management. The vast majority of Western society is indebted. The vast majority doesn't know how to create even a little bit of savings. A digital experience can help you understand that maybe going, having your fifth trip to Starbucks that week isn't a good idea. 
small example, but those are the kinds of things we're talking about. Or I want to save for a wedding, or I want to save for, uh, for retirement. Dig digital experiences can be amazing, particularly with AI, particularly with, with some of the personetics types of uh, propositions. Faster payments, innovative payments, people will use this if payments work better. I can pay my friends, I can pay, I can pay, and it's cheaper to pay too. Keep in mind, when we talk about payments and open banking, still have five minutes, thanks. When we talk about payments and open banking, we're not just talking about disrupting banks. We're talking about disrupting payment rails. We're talking about disrupting credit card companies, issuers, and acquirers. That's all right in the crosshairs of PSD2. This isn't just about banks. This is about the entire ecosystem. Um, getting a better deal and access to credit. As, uh, as Mr. Stern said, it doesn't guarantee you're going to have the lowest rate. But if you have trouble getting credit or getting a good deal on credit, open banking will most certainly make that a whole lot easier. With a few clicks, and we've already seen this in the UK, you can find out who will offer you credit at the best price and looking at things which historically they didn't look at. So not just looking at the credit reference agencies, but looking at your spending history and your likelihood to pay. So it's cool stuff. And obviously banking services available in new digital channels. We have to understand as banks that our, we can't force our customers to interact with us just in our channels, just in our branches, just on our telephones, and just on our devices. Customers want to interact with us in social media, on Facebook. They want to interact with us when they're checking out to buy something to say, hey, can I get installment lending? They want to interact with us on voice devices like Alexa. They want to interact with us in their cars. APIs make that all possible. So where are we in the live market as of February? There are 230 third parties in various states of approval in the UK. Uh, 90 have been approved thus far. 20 are actually active. They're out there with, with offerings. There's been tw there were 26 million API calls from those third parties to the nine banks in February alone. That's nothing. That's tiny. Roll the clock forward a few years. It won't be 26 million. It'll be in the billions, easily. And when we think about payments, about how open banking payments will disrupt debit cards and credit cards, it'll be in the tens of billions per month. And availability of APIs isn't bad. We're less than a year in at this point, and 97% availability on a 24-hour clock. That's not bad. So I work for a bank. Many of you work for banks, not all of you. Um, there's risks to us. What are the risks? Disintermediation from banks and non-banks. Disintermediation from digital banks, from challenger banks, from Monzo, from Starling, you've heard of these names, from Revolut, um, from challenger banks, from the metros, from non-banks, uh, companies whose businesses have nothing to do with banking, but they want to be the front end of your banking service. They want to provide you with an app on your phone that is better than what you have, and show you the whole market of financial products that are probably, potentially, maybe, a better deal or, or, or more uh, customized just for you. Margin compression. With marketplaces and transparency comes margin compression, and the, mar and the revenue and, and profits will squeeze down. And the initial costs and complexities to create everything we've talked about in the land of APIs, it's very expensive, and it is very complex, I'll be honest. But what does that mean for us? We can deliver to current customers and future customers on new devices and channels. To be honest with you, I'm in active conversations with the likes of Facebook, with Amazon, and dozens of others. Product distribution opportunities, places where we don't normally sell products because they're not our customers, we can put things in new places. Installment lending for companies that would like to be able to do business digitally, but the sometimes with the bigger basket sizes, it's hard to convert those. Integration with business customers. Our very own business customers can connect with the bank. Not just fintechs, every customer. They can connect with us. Real-time payments, real-time uh, account data, et cetera. It'll enable our business customers to be more efficient and effective. Fintech uh, partnerships. Historically, when a bank wants to work with a fintech, you could spend 12 or 15 months just arranging everything. With what we've done today, we've proven it three times this year, we can get connectivity in place in two weeks. Improve time to market for our digital propositions, those ecosystems we talked about, and driving innovation. So, parting thoughts. I got 33 seconds, so sorry for speaking so quickly. Um, although open banking is about competition, we talked about leveling the playing field, non-bank participants. We've talked about 
the fact that this is starting in Europe and the UK. We've already got Canada, Brazil, Australia, here in Israel, Japan, all actively seeking a similar outcome. Um, and there's active discussions in the UK about how do we move this beyond the current regulation? How do we open up pensions and investments and other things? The reality is open banking, for me, is the tip of an iceberg on open data. The fact that all of us own our data and we should be able to move that around as we wish for our own benefit. So I think it's bigger than just banking. So with that, and having used up 30 minutes, and no one having fallen, only two people haven't fallen asleep so far, I do want to say thank you. Bye.